I have a message that really is looking at different scriptures today, and it's focusing in on the first point, really, of uh, our morning message, which I said, when it comes to God's work, because it is a supernatural thing, uh, we are waging a spiritual war. And that's exactly what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5 where he says that while we walk in the flesh, that is, we walk in the physical realm, we don't war in the physical realm. We war in the spiritual realm. He said the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not fleshly. They're not physical. They are spiritual, he said, to the pulling down of strongholds, etc. And so what I'd like to share with you this afternoon is what I'm uh, uh, titling spiritual warring, spiritual warring. And you know, because human beings live in a physical uh, material body, I think that that automatically makes us most familiar with the physical, with the earthly, uh, with the visible seen realm that uh, we live in. However, don't forget the fact that we also have an invisible part. We have a soul, we have a spirit, and uh, that soul and spirit is not only in this physical realm, but it's also connected to the invisible, heavenly realm, the spiritual realm. And uh, so, when you think of a human being, you have to always remember that a human being is a whole person. That is, a human being is not just a body. A human being is a, is a person that has a body and a soul and a spirit, and these are interconnected to both realms, a physical, visible realm on earth and a spiritual, invisible realm in what Ephesians calls the heavenlies, okay? And uh, so, as a result, our physical, visible, earthly realm that we live in is invaded, is influenced, and is impacted by that invisible, unseen realm, by that spirit realm, the heavenly realm. In fact, in that uh, unseen realm, there is a campaign of war that uh, is raging. In fact, this spirit, this spiritual warfare began way back. It originated with Satan when he rebelled against God. And so we are seeing and we are feeling the effects in our visible world. We are experiencing and reading about the evil that seems to be more and more encroaching, not only in our society, but around the world. The death, the destruction, and this is what's behind it. And for Satan to further his rebellion against uh, God, he continues to counter God's plan by attacking people. And uh, specifically, he attacks God's people. He attacks the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, so if you are a believer, then you are placed in this spiritual battle. You might say, you are a soldier, spiritually warring. But here's the good news that I want to begin with. Christ has already won the victory. Jesus has already won the victory. He possesses total authority. And here's the thing. He has entrusted his authority to his church, to believers. And so we want to begin by looking, first of all, at the victor, and that's Jesus himself. And I'm thinking about Colossians chapter 2, so I don't know if you want to turn there, uh, but in, in Colossians chapter 2, 
and uh, the 15th verse, I think it is. The 15th verse, yes. This is about Jesus. He says, and having spoiled, notice this, principalities and powers. That uh, those two words refer to unseen evil spirits in that unseen realm. And spoiled means disarmed, having disarmed. In other words, he is victor over the unseen realm of evil spirits. Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them or being victorious over them. The Lord Jesus, our Savior, the one in, that is in us and we're in him, the Lord Jesus is the victor. He has universal kingdom authority. In fact, go back a, a few, uh, just uh, a couple of books to Ephesians chapter 1, if you will. Ephesians chapter 1. And uh, I'd like to just read verses 20 and 21. Talking again about Jesus, the victor which he wrought in Christ, God wrought in Christ or worked in Christ when he raised him, Jesus, from the dead and set him, Jesus, at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power, there's the words again, far above all of these evil spirits and good ones for that matter, and uh, power and might and dominion and every name that uh, is named, not only in this world, but also in the world to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to us, to the church. Jesus is the victor. He has universal kingdom authority, according to just a couple of these scriptures that we will look at. Based upon that, I want to pause a moment, have a word of prayer, and then talk about Jesus, the victor, as a king with a universal kingdom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can look to him and that we can trust him and that we're in him. And what a blessing it is to have him in us. And Lord, I pray that we would understand the seriousness of the position that we are in as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, that we would take full advantage of the victor, Jesus, and then the victory that he gives to us through himself. We thank you for this truth that we've already uh, thought about. Lord, may it go deep into our soul and may we live by it. And may it make a great difference in the way that we handle our daily lives and circumstances that sometimes we don't anticipate nor have control over ourselves. And we just thank you for this truth and for the hope, the hope, the wonderful hope that we have in Jesus, the victor, as we pray for his sake. Amen. So as the victor, I said, he possesses universal kingdom authority. He's the king, you might say. Jesus in the Bible is presented as the king of all kings. Now, let's go back in time as far as human history is concerned. And think about the fact that when God created Adam, God delegated to Adam in that garden where he placed him dominion over the kingdom of the earth. In fact, you remember what he said in Genesis 1, 26, God is said to create man in his own image and to give to man dominion over all of the earth and everything in it. At the fall in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam sinned, by disobeying God's command. At the fall, here's what happened. That kingdom of the earth that God gave man dominion over 
was legally delivered out of Adam's hand, out of man's hand, into the hands of Satan. That's why the Bible calls Satan the God of this world. And that's uh, why in that temptation in the wilderness, when Satan took Jesus up on the top of a high mountain and said, if you will but bow down to me, in other words, worship me, I will grant you all the kingdoms of the world. This is the God of the world speaking. He's become the legal recipient of dominion over the kingdom of this earth. But you know what Jesus did? And he hinted at it when he was headed to Calvary. In John chapter 12, where Jesus says, when I'm lifted up, he meant when I'm crucified, when I'm hung on that tree, when I'm hung on that cross, I'll draw all men to myself. Just before he, uh, uh, he died, he said, now is the prince or the God of this world, you might say, now is the prince of this world judged. What he meant was on that cross, he was going to take back that kingdom as the second Adam the first Adam disobeyed. He lost dominion of the kingdom of the earth. The second Adam obeyed and legally regained the kingdom of the earth. That's what he meant when he said the prince of this world is judged. So Jesus as the victor is first of all the king. I'm laying the groundwork for you to understand the victory, the triumph that we as believers have in Christ. Jesus is the king, and you can't have a king without a kingdom, right? So Jesus has a kingdom. There is a future promised kingdom to Israel that represents both a, the, the spiritual and physical realm. It will be a physical kingdom, and, uh, and what will be manifest in that future kingdom that God promised to Israel, we call it the millennium, the thousand-year reign. Of Messiah. What will be manifested during that kingdom age is now present in the spiritual kingdom in the spirit realm. There is a spiritual kingdom that exists even now. Listen to this. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13. Paul is giving thanks to the Father who hath delivered us from the power of darkness or the authority of the kingdom of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So Jesus is a king, and he has a current kingdom now. It's a spiritual one. He's the victor. Now, because he is the victor, there are two victors. There are two victors. And obviously, the first one is Jesus. The important truth about Jesus being the victor is stated in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 19 down to verse 23. And I didn't, I didn't read that whole section, but I did read, uh, I think, verses 20 and 20 to 22. In verses 19 to 23, that section of Ephesians 1, should I read it again? Here is what it says. Paul is actually praying. He's praying that God would open the understanding of the church in Ephesus, that they would understand what the exceeding greatness of God's power to them who believe is. He says, according to the working of his mighty power, that mighty power that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, set him at his own right hand in the heavenlies, and verse 22, and put all things under his feet. He set him above all principality and power, put all things under his feet. He's, this is the position of Jesus the Messiah, who is the victor. This is Messiah's position. It's an emphasis on the extraordinary, powerful display 
in the resurrection and the enthronement, set him on his own right hand, the enthronement of Jesus, so that in the 18th verse of Colossians 1, he talks about him uh, who is the firstborn and who is in all things to have the preeminence. It is this position. It is resulting in Jesus the victor being put into position of having universal and get this eternal authority. Universal and eternal authority. But you know what's even more wonderful than that? Is what the the uh, fallout is for us. The benefits for us. Look at chapter 2 of this same book of Ephesians. And you hath he quickened, that is, resurrected, made alive, who were dead in sins, in trespasses and sins. So what we find in that first verse is that our position is equal to Jesus' position. We have undergone a co-resurrection. That's what verse 1 is. But drop down to verse 6, this same chapter 2. And he's raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places, or in the heavenlies, in Christ Jesus. So the believer's position is that we have been co-resurrected with Jesus. We have been uh, co-enthroned with Jesus, which means... The, deleg- the authority that Adam lost in the garden, that Jesus regained as the second Adam at Calvary, has been redelegated to the believing church. Isn't that amazing? We have redelegated authority. That's the position. We are seated with him. Where is he seated? In Ephesians 1 and uh, uh, verse uh, twenty. And 21, he seated at the right hand in, in the heavenly places, far above all of these spirits, these entities, the this hierarchy, verse 22, and has put all things under his feet. He's our head. We're his body. All of these are under his feet. Well, feet are part of the body. And so the fact of the matter is we are victors in Christ. Because of Christ's position, the Christian's position is that we have been co-raised with him. We have been co-enthroned with him. And so he has redelegated the authority of the kingdom of this earth to the church, to the body of Jesus. That's amazing. So that is... That not only he is the victor, but he makes us victors as well, because we're in him. The third and final point that I want to make before we have a a Q&A or discussion between us is I want to not only talk about the victor, him, Jesus, and the victors, which are him and us, but thirdly and finally, I want to talk about the victory, what that victory entails. I just summed it up in the fact that Jesus has redelegated the authority of the kingdom of this earth to his church. We have victory in and through Jesus alone in the spirit realm over this earth. Now, look back with me in Ephesians 1. And remember, I said Paul is praying for this Ephesian church, that God would give them this understanding, that God would enlighten their spiritual understanding. He'd illuminate their 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 mind, their thinking. That's what verse 18 says. They'd be enlightened. What does he want them to be enlightened about? Well, several things. The hope of Jesus' calling on their life the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. We often talk about what we inherit in Christ. 
But Paul says, what I want the Holy Spirit to show you is what an inheritance you are in the eyes of Jesus. And the third thing he prays is, I want the Holy Spirit to enlighten the believer's understanding regarding the exceeding greatness of the power of God to usward who believe. Now notice the word believe there. This is the requirement for you to enjoy the victory that Jesus won for you and I. When he raised us from spiritual death and spiritually enthroned us in the heavenlies. It requires that you believe. And that is in the present tense in the verse. It means that you keep on depending that the same power that brought Jesus out of that grave and enthroned him on the right hand of the majesty on high is available to you and I. That same power is available to you and I. And that's why Jesus said this in illustration to the victory that we can have over Satan. He said, you know, no man enters into a man's house that is stronger than him and, uh, and strips him of his goods. Before he does that, he has to have the power to first of all tie up and bind that man that is stronger than him so that then he can go in and take whatever he desires to take. And Jesus uses that illustration to say, exercise the authority that I have re-delegated to you in the heavenly realm over the kingdom of this earth. Exercise that kind of power. Bind the strong man, and the strong man is none other than Satan himself. Bind that strong man and then enter into his, his, uh, his usurped realm as the god of this world and spoil his goods. Take from his possession what is not rightfully his, but God's. That's what he's saying in Matthew 12, 29. James says it in a much simpler way, easier, soft way. He simply says it this way. If you'll submit yourself to God and resist the devil, he's going to run. He's going to flee. The devil's going to flee from you. Why? Because you have the victory. Because you have Christ's delegated authority. But you got to believe that. You got to believe it. That's what he says. What is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe? If you don't believe it, you'll never exercise it. If you don't believe it, you'll never use it. You'll never take advantage of it. Victory has to be taken on the basis of the fact that you believe this truth and you apply it, you claim it personally. Now, this victory, this power is applied according to two aspects of warfare. You know, in sports, there's offense and defense, right? Mm -hmm. Well, same thing in warfare. There is a defensive war. There is an offensive war. There is a, a part of war in which you are just defending yourself from the attack of the enemy. There is an offensive war where you're running a campaign and you are on the offense attacking the enemy and he's on the defense. Go back with me to Ephesians chapter 6, please. This is a, a standard and probably most familiar passage on spiritual warfare. Ephesians chapter 6 begins, Wherefore, verse 13, Take up the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore. Here's what I want you to realize. There's two aspects of spiritual warfare, of spiritual warring. The first aspect is defense. That's what Ephesians 6 is talking about. Ephesians 6 is all about defensive warfare. It's not about offensive. It's about defensive warfare. That's why there is the repetition of stand, withstand. In other words, you're standing your ground. Uh, you're, uh, you're, and... 
Take up the whole armor of God, he says. Each piece, and he's going to, I think, enumerate about half a dozen pieces of ancient armor and liken that to the spiritual warfare that we have. Each piece, the whole armor, take up the whole armor. Each piece is necessary for you to stand, for you to defend yourself against the onslaught, against the offensive attack of the wicked one. Chapter 6, it's defensive spiritual warfare. Let's look at the pieces real quickly. Having your loins girt about with truth. That is, if I could put it in simpler terms, having a belt of truth on. The belt was used to, uh, to hold other pieces of armor in place. I mean, for instance, the sword was hooked to the belt. Uh, uh, the other pieces of armor would uh, clip to the belt. So at the center of everything was the belt on the soldier. So what is he saying here when he says, as far as your defense against the wicked one, against these spiritual evil forces, put on the belt of truth. Here's what he means. At the center of your thinking, you should know this throne seat authority that we are taught in Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 2, that you have been co-resurrected and you have been co-enthroned with Christ, that you're seated in Christ far above all of these evil powers that have already been defeated by Jesus. And so you have delegated to you all the authority and power of the Lord Jesus Christ, who himself said, all authority in heaven, all power in heaven and earth are mine. That's been delegated to you. That's what it means to have the belt of truth on. It means that at the center of your understanding, your thinking, is that you are seated in the heavenlies in Christ, that you have this, this throne seat authority. Okay? And then he says, and uh, also and having on the breastplate of righteousness. And the breastplate of righteousness, of course, was that it was that big piece of armor that uh, probably went from the neck down to the waist. And uh, it covered the whole, at least the whole front of the soldier. And I think what he's saying here spiritually, in spiritual warfare, you want to defend yourself against wicked, evil forces. Your soul, Remember I said you have an invisible part, not only a body, but you have a soul and as well as a spirit. Your soul needs to be enveloped with Christ's righteousness. That is, you have to be a believer that is walking in the light, not in the darkness, walking in the light, possessing a clean heart. Simply means that you're right with God. When you're right with God, you're walking with the Lord you walk in the light and the power to walk in the light isn't ours it's given to us by the lord he imparts a righteousness not only do are do you know the difference between impute and impart okay to impute means that uh spiritually when we get saved all the righteousness of jesus is put to our account okay there's that spiritual transaction it's invisible, but it's true. But if you're a believer, when you depend upon the Holy Spirit in you, the Holy Spirit empowers you to do right. He imparts right living into your life. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. And instead of being an angry, bitter person, I can be a sweet, uh, loving person. You see, it's imparted, it's not me, it's his imparted righteousness. So what I'm saying is the breastplate of righteousness is your best defense because you're under attack from wicked uh, forces is that your soul is enveloped with Christ's imparted righteousness, that you are walking in the light, you possess a clean heart, you know, as far as you know, there's nothing between your soul and Jesus. You're right with him. You know, you can have that assurance. 
you can have that complete assurance that there's uh, there's nothing in my conscious mind that that uh, I know of that displeases God. I made myself right with him by confessing it, by getting owning it, getting it right with him. That's what 1 John 1, 7 to 9 is all about. Then the third thing there is um, stand therefore, he says, and have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. How is that a defense against satanic attack? I think it means you stand steadfast on the truth of Christ's authority over the unseen realm that he's delegated to you, and that will infuse into your heart a supernatural peace that Jesus gives. My peace give I unto you, not as the world gives. That peace that passeth all understanding, it's incomprehensible. It's the result of standing steadfast on the truth of the believer's authority over the unseen realm. And that gives you peace. And then he says in verse 16, take up above all, finally, take all, take the shield of faith wherewith you'll be able to quench or extinguish the fiery darts of the wicked, literally the wicked one. What's the shield of faith when it comes to a defense against satanic attack? I think the shield of faith is that we need to continue to actively realize I am dependent upon God. That's the shield of faith. It's God dependence in all of this. And it will quench or extinguish those fiery darts, those sinful thoughts or feelings that are hurled at your soul that spark in you feelings of hatred or impurity or pride or anxiety at a time when you sense an enveloping darkness or depression around you, it's this activation on a constant basis of real dependence upon God that will put the fire out, those fiery darts in your mind, in your thinking, in your heart, in your soul. It says also, Put on the helmet of salvation, verse 17. The helmet of salvation. And don't think of that as saved from sin. <laughs> Just because the word salvation appears, it doesn't always mean saved from sin. I think the helmet of salvation here is simply this. The helmet of salvation is convincement that the victory is already won in Christ that you already are rescued, that you already have triumphed because Christ triumphs for you in your place, and you claim that. And then the last thing he mentions in that 17th verse is, and also have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, some people say, okay, everything else in the passage is, is, def is defense, but the sword, that's offense. I don't think so. In the context, I think it's all defense. I think the sword here is simply you're blocking. You're blocking the blow of the wicked one with the sword of the spirit. You're taking defensive measures with the scripture. It's the Holy Spirit inspired scripture that counters the, the, uh, the thoughts that the enemy attacks you with. That is the sword of the spirit. I said there's two ways in which we spiritually war. There is the defensive, but there also is the offensive. And here it is spelled out by Jesus. He said this in Matthew 6, 8, 16, 18. He warns them. He, he says, you know what? I'm going to build my church. And he says, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You know what picture he paints there? He, he, it's a picture of the church storming the gates of hell. Storming Hades, if you will. It's, it's the church storming a wicked culture. A, in, in a wicked nation. 
and that the, the wicked culture cannot sustain it. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, that doesn't mean that there's no persecution. But you know what? Sometimes the way that God overthrows a wicked country or a, a wicked regime is through the torture and the persecution of his people. It's through the blood of the martyrs that the church grows. It's like the fertilizer, you might say. So what he's saying here is that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, it will completely batter down and be victorious over everything that the kingdom of Satan might have to stand up against it. That's what he means, I think, also in that portion in 2 Corinthians 10 that we looked at this morning. The weapons of our warfare are not fleshly. They're not just human. They are supernatural. They're mighty through God. They're supernaturally powerful to the demolishing, to the pulling down of fortresses, evil spiritual fortresses, strongholds, walls of resistance in thinking, wrong thinking, deceptive thinking that's fostered by and that is in deep opposition to truth by the God of this world that blinds the minds of unbelievers. Those can be demolished. They can be penetrated by the Lord Jesus through his people. And I think he does it through his people interceding in prayer for the victory in Christ and declaring a Holy Spirit-empowered message and truth. So that's what I mean by spiritual war.